the degree a muscle is lengthened during resistance training can impact how effective our training is for muscle growth. But how much of an impact does muscle lengthening have on long-term muscle growth? To what extent should we try to lengthen our muscles while lifting? And ultimately, is it worth trying to focus on lengthened biased training? First, let's cover what exactly muscle length means. This simply refers to the amount a muscle is stretched during resistance exercises. There are three primary ways in which muscle length can be manipulated during resistance training. The first and most obvious is via range of motion. Training through a larger range of motion typically results in training at a longer muscle length, while partial range of motion training generally limits the degree of lengthening occurring at the muscle. As a simple example, going further down during a bicep curl will stretch the biceps to a greater extent, whereas if we cut range of motion short, then the biceps won't reach the same level of stretch. However, this isn't always the case. We are still able to maximally lengthen a muscle using partial range of motion. It depends on what part of the movement the partial range of motion is performed. In most cases, we think of partial range as skipping the lengthened range like the example we previously mentioned. This is what we would call shortened partials. However, partials can also be performed in the lengthened range only where we skip the shortened range. This can be termed lengthened partials. For example, during bicep curls, only performing the top half of the movement would be shortened partial reps, which wouldn't stretch the biceps as much. But if just the bottom half of the movement is performed, this would be lengthened partials and would still achieve the same level of muscle stretch compared with full range of motion curls. The second way in which we can manipulate muscle length is via exercise selection. Some exercises train our muscles in a more stretched position than others. This is based on the anatomy of each muscle and the joint positions that each exercise requires us to train through. Some examples of this include the seated incline dumbbell curl training the biceps in a more stretched position than a preacher curl, even if full range of motion is performed for both exercises. This is because the biceps are lengthened to a greater extent due to the position of our shoulder. Other examples of this include a seated leg curl training the hamstrings at a longer length than lying leg curls, and overhead tricep extensions will train the long head of the triceps in a more stretched position than tricep pushdowns. And the third variable is the resistance profile of the exercise. This refers to the amount of tension during the exercise at different parts throughout the range of motion. An example of an exercise with a fairly extreme resistance profile is a dumbbell lateral raise, which has almost no resistance in the bottom position and far more resistance in the top position. Whereas a cable lateral raise can bias more tension in the bottom position and less in the top position, depending on the specific setup and execution. Technically, the resistance profile of an exercise doesn't actually influence how much a muscle is lengthened during an exercise. However, it influences how much tension the muscle experiences at different muscle lengths. For example, a squat is hardest in the bottom half when the quadriceps and glutes are in their most lengthened position, and easiest in the top half when they are most shortened. Whereas most rows are easiest when the arms are far away from the body, which is when the back muscles are most lengthened, and they are hardest when the arms are closest to the body, which is when the back muscles are most shortened. Now that we have discussed what muscle length is and how it is manipulated with different resistance training variables, the real question is, how does muscle length impact muscle growth? Let's now look at how muscle length impacts hypertrophy from each individual variable. First, let's look at range of motion. We tend to find that achieving longer muscle lengths via a larger range of motion is generally more effective than cutting range of motion short. For example, this study compared the effects of squat training to either full depth or partial depth on lower body muscle growth. It was found that the full depth squats resulted in greater overall increases in muscle volume compared with partial depth squats. So if increasing range of motion takes the muscle into a more lengthened position, it will likely be beneficial for hypertrophy. However, as we have discussed, partial range of motion doesn't always mean that the muscle is trained at a shorter length. This is because partial range of motion could be performed as shortened partials or lengthened partials. So another question is, is it better to perform partial reps in the lengthened half of the movement compared with standard full range of motion training for muscle growth? 
Well, in isolation, the evidence tends to find similar or slightly superior growth from lengthened partials. For example, this study compared the effects of performing leg extensions with either partial range of motion in the lengthened position, partial range of motion in the shortened position, full range of motion, or alternating between the lengthened and shortened partial ranges. It was found that all groups including the lengthened range of the exercise saw greater increases in quadriceps cross-sectional area compared with the shortened partials, and there seemed to be slightly superior growth in the two groups including lengthened partials compared with the full range of motion group. Another study compared the effects of performing calf raises with either a full range of motion, partial range in the lengthened position, or partial range in the shortened position. It was found that the lengthened partials produced the greatest increases in gastrocnemius muscle thickness, with the full range of motion and shortened partials being slightly inferior. And while these effects are noticeable in very isolated training scenarios, the same results may not be seen in practice. When we perform a well-rounded, full-body training routine, these small benefits from lengthened partials seem to be mostly washed out. This was seen in this study, which compared the effects of performing a comprehensive upper body training routine using different ranges of motion. One group performed full range of motion for all exercises, while the other group performed lengthened partials for all exercises. After 8 weeks of training, it was found that biceps and triceps muscle thickness increased to a similar magnitude in both groups, with no notable differences between them. Another potential application for lengthened partials is as a way to extend a set beyond failure for some exercises. For exercises where we are significantly stronger in the lengthened range of the exercise, we can usually perform additional reps in the lengthened position after reaching failure using a full range of motion, and this may allow us to achieve even greater muscle growth in some cases. For example, this study compared the effects of performing calf raises using either full range of motion to failure or by performing additional partial reps after full range failure was reached. It was found that gastrocnemius muscle thickness increased to a slightly greater magnitude in the leg performing extended sets compared with the full range of motion training. So overall, it seems that achieving longer muscle lengths via training through a larger range of motion is beneficial for muscle growth. This can be achieved by training with a full range of motion or by performing partial reps in the lengthened half of the exercise. And for some exercises, it may be beneficial to perform additional lengthened partial reps as a way to extend a set beyond traditional full range of motion failure. Next, let's look at the influence of muscle length manipulated via exercise selection. We tend to find that exercises which train the same muscle in a more lengthened position seem to produce a little more muscle growth. For example, this study compared the effects of performing the seated versus lying leg curls on hamstrings hypertrophy. Seated leg curls train the hamstrings in a more lengthened state since they are being lengthened from the hip due to the seated position, whereas lying leg curls train the hamstrings in a more shortened state due to the neutral hip position. It was found that the hamstrings saw overall slightly greater increases in muscle volume from the seated leg curls compared with lying leg curls. Furthermore, this study compared the effects of overhead tricep extensions versus tricep pushdowns on triceps hypertrophy. The overhead extensions train the long head of the triceps in a more stretched state since they are lengthened due to the shoulder position, whereas tricep pushdowns train them in a more shortened state due to the shoulder position. It was found that the overhead triceps extensions resulted in slightly superior overall increases in triceps muscle volume compared with the tricep pushdowns. And this study compared the effects of performing standing versus seated calf raises. The standing calf raises train the gastrocnemius in a more stretched state due to the extended position of the knee, whereas the seated calf raises train the gastrocnemius in a more shortened state due to the flexed knee position. It was found that both heads of the gastrocnemius saw greater increases in muscle volume from the standing calf raises, whereas the soleus, whose length isn't influenced by knee position, saw similar growth between the two exercises. So when all other factors are equated, an exercise which trains the target muscle at a longer length usually results in slightly superior growth. However, we should also keep in mind that the length a muscle is trained at isn't the only factor which determines hypertrophy outcomes. As we will discuss soon, the exercise which trains the muscle at a longer length isn't always the one which results in the greatest muscle growth. 
Next, let's look at the influence of the resistance profile on muscle growth. More specifically, does exposing the muscle to higher tension when at longer lengths result in greater hypertrophy? Well, there isn't much evidence on this topic, but from what we have, it doesn't seem to have a major influence on hypertrophy outcomes. For example, this study compared the effects of performing preacher curls with either a cable or barbell. In this case, the cable curls involve less tension at the bottom when the biceps are lengthened, and more tension in the top position when they are shortened. While the barbell curl has more tension in the bottom position when the biceps are lengthened, and less in the top position when they are shortened. It was found that biceps muscle thickness increased to a similar magnitude after both preacher curl variations. Another study compared the effects of performing dumbbell versus cable lateral raises on deltoid hypertrophy. In this case, the dumbbell lateral raise has less tension in the bottom position when the deltoid is lengthened, and peak tension in the top position when the delts are shortened. While the cable variation is the opposite, greater tension in the bottom, the lengthened position, and less tension in the top, the shortened position. It was found that both variations resulted in similar increases in muscle thickness of the lateral deltoid. And another related study compared the effects of performing Smith machine squats versus leg extensions on quadriceps hypertrophy. In this case, the squats are going to involve greater tension in the bottom position when the quads are most lengthened, and less tension at the top when they are shortened. While the leg extensions, depending on the specific machine, usually involve less tension in the bottom position when the quads are lengthened, and more tension in the top position when they are shortened. It was found that the rectus femoris saw greater muscle growth from the leg extensions, which is expected due to its biarticular nature, while the vastus lateralis saw similar growth from both exercises. So, from the evidence we have, there doesn't seem to be a major influence on muscle growth in terms of whether the peak tension exists at longer or shorter muscle lengths. It seems to be more important to train close to failure, ensuring the target muscle is the limiter of the set. So far, it seems that lengthened biased training tends to be overall slightly favourable for hypertrophy. However, it is also important to understand an important caveat. When we say that training at longer muscle lengths is beneficial for hypertrophy, this assumes that all other factors are equated. This is important because muscle length is just one factor contributing to the effectiveness of an exercise. If other factors are sacrificed just to achieve a greater muscle length, the results are not always as favourable. Other factors such as stability, comfort, the involvement of accessory and stabiliser muscles, and the degree of cardiorespiratory fatigue can all influence the effectiveness of an exercise. And in some cases we find that when some of these other variables are sacrificed, it may counteract the benefit of lengthened bias training. For example, this study compared the back squat versus the hip thrust on lower body muscle growth. In this case, the squats take the glutes through a little more range of motion and involve more tension in the lengthened position, while the hip thrust probably takes the glutes through slightly less range of motion and has less tension in the lengthened position. Although it was found that the glute max experienced similar increases in muscle cross-sectional area from both exercises, despite the squats being more lengthened biased than the hip thrusts. So, despite squats being a little more lengthened biased, glute hypertrophy was similar to that of the hip thrust. This may be because the hip thrust is more stable, easier to perform, and makes it easier to ensure the glutes are trained to true muscular failure. Whereas squats are a little less stable, a little more fatiguing on the cardiorespiratory system, and may have other muscles limit performance before the glutes. Furthermore, this study compared the effects of preacher curls versus inclined seated dumbbell curls on biceps hypertrophy. In this case, the biceps are trained at a shorter length in the preacher curls, but a longer length during the inclined seated curls. However, overall increases in biceps muscle thickness were similar after both bicep curl variations. So despite the seated curls training the biceps in a more stretched state, muscle growth outcomes were similar. This could be due to the preacher curl being more stable, easier to perform, more comfortable, or any other reason. Whereas the incline curls may be a little less stable, a little more technically demanding, and overall harder to train the biceps to true failure. In any case, the point is that muscle length isn't the only factor influencing the effectiveness of an exercise. It seems to be much more important to ensure you are training close to failure, with the target muscle being what limits performance of each set.
So while lengthened biased training generally seems to be beneficial for muscle growth, there are some potential downsides we should be aware of. There are three potential limitations of lengthened biased training which may apply in certain scenarios. The first is due to muscle soreness. Lengthened biased training typically exacerbates the amount of muscle soreness we experience from training. In most cases, this is probably a good indicator that the training effectively caused a disruption to the target muscle and provided a good hypertrophic stimulus. And in most cases, this is probably a good sign. However, in some cases, the additional soreness may not be wanted. In beginners, those returning to training after a layoff, or when trying to limit fatigue to peak for a sport or event, we may want to limit the amount of lengthened biased training performed. This is because we probably don't want to induce excessive soreness at this stage, and lengthened bias training can exaggerate how much soreness they experience. This can make a lifter excessively sore for multiple days, potentially limiting how frequently they can train that muscle group, or inhibit performance of the sport or event they are peaking for. Of course, we adapt to this over time, but in some scenarios, excessive soreness is unwanted. Another potential issue with lengthened biased training is the exercise setup. When this type of training is taken too far, the setup required to achieve the maximally lengthened biased movement pattern can be elaborate. While it isn't a physiological issue, it can become a practical limitation. It may require you to use more equipment, take up more space, or take up more time to set up the exercise. If you are someone who has unlimited time to train, and you train in a home gym or a large gym with lots of space and equipment, then this may not be a concern. But for a smooth, time-efficient training session, if the exercise setup is elaborate, excessive focus on lengthened bias training may simply not be worth the small additional benefits. In many cases, it may be a better trade-off to simply perform the exercise with a simpler setup. And on a similar note, the other potential downside of lengthened biased training is the fact that unilateral variations are often required. To train a muscle in its most lengthened state, we sometimes need to perform single arm or single leg exercises. For example, to achieve maximal stretch on some of the back muscles, the arms need to be moved across the body. This requires unilateral rows and pulldowns to achieve the extra little bit of stretch that we don't get from bilateral back exercises. And while this is completely fine to do, it may just be a little less practical. Unilateral exercises take more time to get through since twice the number of sets are performed. They are also usually a little more psychologically fatiguing since you are required to concentrate and push close to failure twice as many times. This can make workouts a little less time efficient and a little more effortful to complete. This isn't always an issue, but we should just be aware that implementing too many unilateral exercises may have some practical issues in some cases. In summary, let's discuss what the practical application of lengthened bias training is. In terms of range of motion, we want to make sure to include the length and range of the exercise. This can be achieved by performing either full range of motion training, or in some cases, partial reps in the lengthened half of the movement. It also seems to be an effective strategy to perform lengthened partials as a way to extend sets after reaching full range of motion failure for exercises where it makes sense to do so. In terms of exercise selection, it seems to be beneficial to train each muscle group in a near maximally lengthened state at least once throughout the week. Not every exercise needs to take the target muscle into a maximal stretch, but including some lengthened biased exercises in a training routine is likely to be beneficial for muscle growth. We also want to make sure we aren't taking lengthened biased training too far to the point where we are sacrificing other variables at its expense. Other factors such as stability, coordination demands, cardio demands, accessory muscles, and so on, all influence the effectiveness of an exercise too. And lastly, there may be some potential downsides to lengthened biased training. We may want to limit lengthened biased training when trying to minimize soreness and fatigue, if the exercise setup is impractical, or if it requires too much use of unilateral exercise variants. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Check out flowhighperformance.com for online coaching, training templates, ebooks, and more.